uh, another episode of I'm in a Car. And Great. I have the pleasure of having Frank Newman with me, so thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here, Rob. Uh, I've been been watching these for some time, so this is this is like a big moment for me, actually. Awesome, that's great. Well, it's yeah. a ton of fun. This is probably one of my uh, favorite highlights of the week is being able to take a drive and talk to entrepreneurs. Um, one of the kind of biggest reasons of this channel is to help entrepreneurs learn from each other so they can mm-hmm. grow their own businesses and kind of enrich their own lives. Um, so you're the owner of Newman HR Consulting. That's correct, yes. And we were just talking a little bit about how you are a human resource environmentalist. That's right, that's right. And, I, and I'm probably the only human resource environmentalist in Canada. Yeah, okay, so what, what the heck is that? Well, what is it? Well, it's great. Well, if you think about an organization, an organization is a complete environment. Um, you know, from the moment you walk through the doors, you get a sense of uh, the furniture, you get a sense of the mission statement on the wall. You get a real sense. It, it is. It is virtually like walking. If you think of it like walking into a forest, there's there's things to grow, there's things to learn, there's things to do. Yeah. And so, so how you? So my approach to business is to say, you know, it's not just HR policies, but it's 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 your management structure. It's how you set up your offices. Do you provide training time for people? It's all as to create your environment. Yeah, and, and it's the, totally fair. And the environment can either either grow or kill a business. And you know, I've got lots of clients in the region, and some of them have great cultures, and some of them have really negative cultures. And you know, there, there's consequences for that. Big time. Because ultimately, you want your you want your people to feel engaged. You want them to feel excited. Uh, you want them to feel passionate about coming into work. Big time. And so, if you don't if you don't get there, then that's that's going to cause serious problems. And, and you know, basically, what they found is with employee engagement, you got great engaged employees. You're going to grow your profits faster. Sure, which is really yeah. key for a small business. And then they're also going to encourage people to stay longer, because you know there's a rule of thumb. I, I don't know if you know this, but if you lose somebody, it's going to cost you three times your your, your cost in terms of having to replace them. Sure. Yeah, you can understand that. Yeah. So so part of what happens uh, with culture is that. Sometimes you get cultures that don't work, and so sometimes within those cultures, uh, you actually have vampires. And I'm sure most people don't go out to hire vampires and think you know, there's vampires in the workforce. Yeah. But, so before before we get into that, yeah, because um, I think that's going to be the main topic, and yeah. I want to get off of it once yeah. we get into it. Um, well, two things. One is uh, the HR environmental, human resource environmentalist. That that concept makes a lot of sense. Um, yes. I, we, I did a video uh, last year about. Um, culture uh, as a petri dish. Ah, and that yes, okay. a leader's a leader's job is really to establish an environment that can foster the desired culture. Yes, and uh, that culture really is a result of the environment. And so mm-hmm. that's really neat that you framed it that way. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So maybe you could just give us a quick little rundown, thirty seconds, maybe a minute, uh, in terms of where you've come from and how you ended up in this field of business. Ah, okay. Well, I, I ended up in HR because of reverse discrimination. So, so basically, when I started, when I left university, I was looking for a job, and I approached an oil company, and they said, "Well, we've got all these ladies in HR. We need a guy." <laughs> and so I couldn't type. I was absolutely hopeless at most things in the office, but they hired me anyway. Yeah, nice. And so I was one out of uh, uh, five people in the five ladies in the office, and, and grew my career from there. So I spent probably forty years in corporate HR companies, like. Blackstone, Smith, Klein, and Manulife, like yeah, Texaco. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, those uh, are small companies. They're small companies. <laughs> so, so I've had the benefit of, of doing incredible things. I I got to hire Jan Arden for a concert once, oh, which, cool which is which is pretty cool. And yeah. Colin James. So, so I that's my business. That's my show business experience. Nice. And then, so about three years ago, I left the corporate world and decided that I've always wanted to have my own business, and realized there's a need for small business to have good HR help. Because sometimes small business owners don't have the resources or they don't have the technical knowledge to be able to, to deal with those tough people problems. Yeah, and I mean, and tough people problems are probably the toughest problems in business. I mean, yeah. um, from whatever, 12 years of running Intrigue, mm-hmm. um, you know, our, our team is our biggest asset. They're the what makes and breaks our success. And when yeah. things aren't going well, it doesn't make, things aren't easy to deal with. So yeah, I can totally understand how there's a ton of opportunity to help people with that type of stuff. Yeah. Well, and what I say to people is the easiest thing is to create a business. The the, the most difficult decision is to hire that first person, because that's that's when you have to have you know, throw caution to the wind and you're going to trust this person to support you. And whether you have one or you have thirty people, uh, it's it's a huge decision. Big time. So um, 
what what would be one of the most kind of common issues or challenges you find entrepreneurs having with human resources? Typically, it, it often goes back to the whole hiring process. Yeah. Uh, just making sure you've got clear understanding of what you need and just overcoming the biases in the recruiting process. So can you break that down a little bit? What do you mean sure. by the biases in the recruiting process? Well, typically, process? like when you're recruiting, first of all, people like to hire people who look like themselves. Right. So, so there's actually a physical challenge if you happen to run into somebody in the, in the interview process who looks like somebody you know you're going to want to hire them. And I've seen that happen. It happened to me once. I, I was interviewing for a job and there was a lady there looked exactly like a lady I knew at my previous job. And this this lady in my previous job was wonderful. She was a great helper. Right. So, of course, I accepted the job. Well, it turned out that was that was not a good mis- good good decision to make. <laughs> right. Uh, so she was like the devil incarnate. But anyway, that's, <laughs> but, so and, and then I had another case where the president of a company hired somebody who looked exactly like his wife. And, and at one time we said, "My goodness, they're like they're like twins." Yeah. Uh, turned out that wasn't a good decision either. Yeah, fair enough. So, what other things do you find with the recruiting process that people need to maybe look at a bit more seriously? At? Uh, typically, it's it's making sure you you're hiring for attitude. Uh, a lot of people hire for technical skills right. uh, because they they've got somebody who can do graphics or they can do someone who can uh, build widgets. Uh, but often you can you you can you can train for skills, but you can't train for attitude. Isn't that the truth? And and, and so if you think about uh, people, I, I know I've probably hired and fired over a thousand people, right. and I've rarely fired someone for technical skills. Right. But it's all about attitude. Interesting. So, can you give us a quick little tip, maybe, on how to identify attitude? Because, like, the recruitment process in itself is a bit of a weird environment. Because mm-hmm. everybody's trying to put their best foot forward and yeah. pretend like they'll do anything under the moon, be able to get a job, and then things kind of roll out and maybe things change. So, how do you identify attitude in like an honest and meaningful way? Uh, typically, what you're going to do is, is you're going to go to what's called behavioral interview questions. Okay. So, you're going to say, uh, "Give me a, a time when you had a when you had a conflict with a coworker." Uh, so you're looking for specific stories, right? Or give me a, give me an example of when you uh, you screwed up a customer order, right. and so you're looking to see stories about how they've performed in the past because the past behavior is likely to be uh, a future behavior. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, and I think sometimes people often make the mistake too of asking questions like, "What would you do if this happened?" Yes. Uh, hypothetical future questions. That's right, yes. Which don't actually help very much, even though they look very similar to a past question. Um, I, I hear it a lot, um, and I think it's maybe people think they're a behavior question, but they're not because it's positioning as a hypothetical, what would you do, and they can use a magic wand. Yes, e- exactly. You're, you're right, Rob. The, uh, and the other thing is often interviewers watching, and even occasionally I'll do this, they'll give leading questions like, you really do like working with people, don't you? And of course, somebody says, absolutely love people. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and you took that off. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's continuing to probe, and, and the other thing I encourage interviewers to do, uh, which sounds contrary to good HR practices, is trust your gut. Because sometimes, well, I'm sure even with, you know, you meet clients, and you say, uh, I'm not sure I want to work with that person. And, and I found more times, you know, nine times out of ten, if you trust your gut, that's, that's going to help. Because ultimately, that gut reaction is about your personal interrelationship with someone. Yeah, that's interesting. You bring that up. Um, Jack Welch has an MBA program. And uh, there was an article, and, uh, and he was talking about recruitment and hiring and people. And it's kind of one of the things he's kind of famous for. And, um, he, he said very, he like essentially said the same thing. Mm-hmm. He's like, people that tell you don't trust your gut, like, just, that's kind of crazy, especially if you've been doing it for a long time and you've got some experience hiring people and letting people go. Yeah, and often, you know, this is one of the, the, the flaws perhaps behind some HR practitioners because often, you know, they're encouraging managers to, you know, take a, take a risk, make a decision. And, uh, and they may overrule that, and I, I've made that mistake in the past where I thought, this is a great candidate. The manager feels uncomfortable and saying, right. ah, you can, you, can, you can go with this, but, but clearly you, you, know, you trust your gut instinct is probably the most important thing you can do. So how do you balance, um, in those couple quick tips, one of them was around this idea of trusting your gut. The other one's around this idea of beware of a bias. Yes, yeah, yeah. So is there any you know, quick maybe tips or tricks that you could provide somebody with to kind of distinguish the two? Yeah, well, uh, and what you can also, part of what you can do is actually get more people involved in the interview process as oh, well. Oh, that's a great idea. Because sometimes, uh, you know, I've had candidates come in for the first interview and they look like, 
you know, God's gift to, to mankind. And then the second interview they come back, it's very, very different because they're either not as prepared for that. So having, you know, multiple interviews and also having somebody there to help validate and, and overcome your bias. So Awesome tips. So if you have a team member that's important, you know, get them involved in that. That's really cool. I really appreciate that, Frank. So one of the reasons we decided to set this, this uh, ride up was to talk about this crazy idea of culture vampires. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So maybe you could unpack that one for us. What are you sure. talking about? Okay. Well, so, so I've been dealing with organization for over 40 years in HR. And, you know, one of the common concerns that, that owners raise is, you know, the culture doesn't feel right here. You know, there's, and often what happens is when you boil down to it, it's one or two people that are just not Complying. And so, so what it looks like is you. In fact, I'll give you. I'll give you a story. Uh, there was an organization I worked with, and they had a they had a receptionist position. Yep. And uh, this lady was right in the middle of the office. She controlled everything. But as soon as the managers would leave, she would start to make comments about management. She would start to undermine things. Right. Uh, she would engage in gossip, which then slowly spread through the office. And this lady was a professional lady, you know, to look at who you think, this is the most wonderful receptionist in the world. Right. However, over time, you know, her, her behavior became more and more dysfunctional. And so it had an impact on the rest of the organization. So in essence, in fact, she was, it was almost like the fangs came out when the managers went away or they, they right. didn't the like. <laughs> yeah. But the sad thing about this is, is these exist everywhere. Right. The other thing to, as point, people have pointed out to me, is sometimes vampires exist at all levels in the organization. Even, and I've seen, I've seen C, CEOs who are really vampires. I had one guy who was so bad, he terrorized his legal counsel so much the man was afraid to speak in public. Wow. So, so clearly, you know, in an organization, you, you've got to, you've got to be mindful of that. And then I guess the worst thing about vampires is they start to erode the saints. So, right. so in every organization, there are what I call saints. And these are people that contribute well. Uh, they, they embody the, extra, the vision and values of the company. It, exactly, yeah. They, uh, you know, these are the people you wish you had a million of them. You right. know, if, you, if you had nothing else, you'd just fill the, fill the room up with these people. Uh, but, and of course, they believe in management. They believe in your mission statement. So, but what can happen is they can get discouraged right. because if they see the vampires not being dealt with, um, they'll start to lose productivity themselves. Sure. Well, then I can also see how that might translate into a lack of confidence in management if there's this issue that isn't being dealt with. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, and then once they start to lose faith, other people see they've lost faith. And, and then you're done. And then you're done because then you've got, it's almost like, you know, vampire cancer. <laughs> you're right. You're running, <laughs> running through the organization. And the, the tough part is it takes real courage to deal with these issues. And, and that's, the, that's the hard part for managers because often, you know, you, you tolerate people for so long, you get used to it. Right. And then at a certain point, you say you've had enough. And so in this case, uh, this one lady I was referring to was with the organization for seven years and the CEO really didn't get along with her at all, but he tolerated her. So eventually, uh, we decided to have her leave the organization. And we did it very respectfully in that. Right. And then over Christmas, he phoned me up and said, Frank, that was the best decision I could have made. The office is so much happier now. Right. And and so here's the corollary of that. So about a year later, I was at a Costco in well, filling up for gas. And the lady we fired pulls up in the gas behind me. Right. And you're never sure what's going to happen. Right? No. <laughs> but she got on the car and said, Frank, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I was so unhappy there, but I was afraid to leave. And she's got a great job now. Awesome. She's happy. Uh, the company's happy. But the pain that that company went through, that's the, that's the real sad part because they lost all this productivity. They lost the credibility of management. Right. Really, really sad. So coming back to that then, um, you know, some people might know they have an in, uh, a culture vampire inside their four walls and after watching this they'd be like oh yeah I know or that, that makes sense I can see somebody mm -hmm. but what if they don't what if what if you're running your business and you're not sure if there's culture vampires how do you figure it out typically well you're gonna look for things you're gonna look for things like turnover you know yeah. are you losing people um, 
often often vamp are sadly your supervisors and so you might see a lot of supervisor uh, not supervisor turnover but their, their staff turnover uh, and they're all, yeah with like within the supervisor group or whichever group yeah the supervisor or, or or they've got a team there and the team keeps changing and they keep saying I can't hire good people. Well, right. sometimes it may be the supervisor that's the vampire. Okay. So, so again, you're going to look for turnover. And then, how do you how do you find it out? Like, if 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 there's a supervisor, let's say let's take this situation, and I'm really looking for a practical tip. If you yep. if you if you're willing to give it away. Yeah, yeah. But I know that okay. There's a group. There's a team of twelve. The team of twelve. There's been some turnover. Maybe two or three people have left from that team over the course of the last six months, mm -hmm. which would be like pretty aggressive turnover. I've identified that there could be an opportunity for a culture vampire, mm -hmm. what do I do? Okay, well, so typically what you're probably, the, the, the first thing a manager has to do is make sure they connect with their people. Okay. So again, you know, making sure you're having regular dialogue with your people and, and being open to that. Okay. Uh, because the key thing is, is for the manager to be approachable in that. So if the manager is approachable, it's, it's more likely the employees will confide in them in terms of this is what's happening in the organization. So you've got to, the manager's got to be able to make sure he's building trust with his people all the time. Right. Uh, and then that way he's going to find out more. But, if, but again, if, if the manager's not trustworthy, they're probably not going to rat out the vampire. Right. You know? Now, the other thing is you, you may find out, you know, through through hearsay or scuttlebutt or another manager will tell you there's something going on in your department. Right. So it, it's really being vigilant around that you know. keeping your ears open and, and taking the time to, to spend time with people and I think um, actually that's one thing we've done I think a pretty good job of yep. at Intrigue where we kind of really have a lot of scheduled time with our mm -hmm. team not only one-on-one -on -one, but in uh, departments as well as company-wide yeah. um, but I know a lot of people when we talk about the model we use kind of like say well, how do you get the time like where do you find the time to do that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, and our kind of answer has always been like well we don't we can't afford not to do it. Yeah. So, like, how do you help people figure out that they they have to because it's probably one of the best uses of their time to, to get yeah. to know their people. Well, well, I I I, 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 I teach uh, some some concepts to managers. It's called the best ten minutes a day, and it's around what I call the the three C's or the five C's. So, so the first is connecting with your employees. Okay. So making sure you're available for them. Um, it's clarifying things for employees because employees ultimately want to know what does it take to be successful here. That is the truth and I think that one's super important. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it goes at all levels. It's everything from, you know, what is my job description to, you know, what's the value, what's the behavior and the values and the value add for, for working at Intrigue. Yeah. You know, and if you can be articulate on that, it's a great way to engage people. And what can, what, what do you expect of me for me to be successful? Exactly. So yeah. I know I'm doing a good job. Yeah. 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 Because, because all a new employee wants to know is, what does it take to be successful? And, and if the manager can define, you know, these are the do's, these are the don'ts, and this is what's important to, uh, to the company or not, taking that time makes a huge difference. And then you get into performance expectations. Yeah. Uh, a lot That's of cool. my clients don't have the ability to, or haven't done performance management reviews, or even just dialogue with employees, and people are starved for feedback. Right, right, so, right. So having that, uh, uh, having that clarification is so important. So connect, clarify. And then the third one is coach. Okay. And so again, you're, you're always wanting to your employees to do better, to do more. So again, moving from being a manager to telling people what to do, uh, to engaging them in how can they do it and asking them questions. So moving from a, a really coaching is really a, a series of questions you're gonna ask someone. Sure, and kind of guiding them through a self-discovery to exactly. take their own action mm -hmm. on the ideas that they can generate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's right, Rob. Because cool. I, I mean, it's asking the questions. The fourth C is courage, and and this is what managers have to display every day because they have to have the courage to make tough decisions. And part of what happens with, with vampires is managers sometimes don't have the courage to address them because they don't want to be bitten. Uh, but sure, yeah, vampires yeah, yeah, got pointy yeah, teeth, right? They got pointy teeth and big fangs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so avoid the fangs, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but again, having the courage to do that. Uh, but it's also having the courage to trust people as well. So you've got to trust the saints, but you've also got to have the courage to address the vampires. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then the final C, uh, which is this little surprising, is, is compassion. Because, you know, if you think about leadership a hundred years ago, and it was all about, you know, people being tough, and it was the, 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 uh, the, the uh, 
Teddy Roosevelt and, yeah. and all those. Oh. You know, let, let, let's go get them, right? Yeah. You know, well, maybe it's the Donald Trump model too. Right, um, right, right. Whereas, whereas if you think of great leaders today, it's, it's people like you know, people that respect Obama or whether it's Gandhi or Lincoln. Uh, those people displayed compassion, and and if you can display that compassion. That's going to be the final seat because then employees will trust you and go through this. That's really cool. So I'm just assuming that you've written a book. I have a book in process, yes. I was going to say because that content that we just went through seems like it would fit in a book really well. Well, it, 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 I'm working on it and then I, I do some presentations and different, different public speaking on that as well. Yeah, okay, cool. So yeah. if somebody wanted you to come do a talk for them, uh, what, what would they do? They would just uh, contact me at uh, www.newmanhumanresources.com. Okay, very cool. So if you were to go back uh, and, and talk to yourself, whatever, 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. when you got into this whole human resource yeah. field of business, mm -hmm. what would you tell yourself that you wish you would have known then that you know now? Oh, Lord. Hmm. It's probably to listen more. Because I think I think listening is the whole key to unlocking the keys for everything. Whether it's dealing with a client as an entrepreneur, as a manager dealing with an employee, it's really around listening. That's cool. Yeah. And, and and if you go through the interview process, that's about listening too. Two ears, one mouth. Use according. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this, Frank. Well, it was an absolute pleasure. It's been really fun, Rob. Thank okay, you very awesome. Much. All right. Okay. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.